Good morning from London on this annual Remembrance Sunday. The Sunday closest to Armistice Day, November the 11th, when fighting in the First World War ended in 1918. A day to remember those killed and injured in war and the families and the friends who grieve. A million British and Commonwealth Service people died in the First World War, half a million in the second. The numbers trip dangerously off the tongue. And since those wars, barely a year without our forces being engaged fighting somewhere in the world, the horror of war and millions of families in distress brought home this Remembrance Sunday by the war in Ukraine and in the Middle East and in Africa. On Husk Horse Guards Parade, 10,000 veterans of war have been assembling to take part in the march past the Cenotaph, which is later this morning, after the two-minute silence at 11 o'clock and the service of remembrance that follows it. And on Whitehall, those taking part in the formal act of commemoration, they're starting to assemble, the mass bands and the pipers who play the same solemn music as has been heard here every year for nearly a hundred years. There'll be on each side of the Cenotaph members of the armed forces representing sea, land, air and the civilian services. And the Household Cavalry will soon be taking up their position. They're just coming down Whitehall now. Band, leading the first of the forces that will be around the cenotaph. And then here, of course, at the cenotaph too, the key to this formal part of the ceremony, the king and other members of the royal family will come. They'll be leading politicians, including the prime minister, senior officers of the armed forces, representatives of the Commonwealth, all taking their places before 11 o'clock and the two minute silence. Then they'll lay their wreaths, following that, the brief service of remembrance taken by the Bishop of London. And that's followed by the great march past the Cenotaph of 10,000 veterans. That's all to come. But for now, let's join Sophie Rayworth, who's on Whitehall. I am here with thousands of people who have been queuing here since first thing this morning, just to make sure that they get their places right here in front of the Cenotaph. It's raining right now, the first time that's happened for a very long time on Remembrance Sunday, but it's not putting anybody off coming here to show their support and pay tribute. I'll be talking to some of the people taking part in the March Pass today, among them a World War II veteran who is 101 years old, and also a young man who's 13 who lost his father in Afghanistan, humbling and moving as always. This year is the 70th anniversary, each year sees one of these anniversaries, of the end of the Korean War. After Japan's defeat in the Second World War, Russia and the United States effectively partitioned the Korean Peninsula and the two halves went to war in 1950. 60,000 members of the British Armed Forces joined the United Nations in defending South Korea and over a thousand British servicemen lost their lives and there will be people marching here today thinking back to that Korean War and among them for the first time since the war ended which is now 92 92 year old Bill Hall has traveled down from Scotland he's going to be here for Remembrance Sunday for the first time I was a baker. I was called up for National Service in 1951. And I landed in the Black Watch. And that's how I went off to Korea. 
I have here, said, we saw on the boat, said, where's this career about? And I said, how can you tell you? 80% of them, I would say, were national service. Landed in Busan. The shell fire was worse in Korea than anything else. Now, I met one of the chaps that had been in the 1939-45 war, and he said, I've never had shell fire like this. And that's when I was blown up. I heard this roar, and I knew it was something horrible. If the shell had landed about another nine inches this way, we wouldn't have been here today. I sat on the hill saying, what the hang am I doing here? We were there for about a week. The Chinese attacked the Americans, and we were told to get up there and help. That was the Battle of the Hook. Me and John Leakey, the chap I was one of the guns with, been told from up there that the, this machine gun's got to be disbanded. So one of you's got to do that. The sergeant, he says, I'll toss the coin. So one of you's got to shout. I said, I'll shout. So I shouted heads, and it came down heads. And I says, well, I'll stay here. The next morning, this sergeant come along and says, I've got something to tell you. Your mate's just been killed. And I'm standing in there thinking, God, that could have been me. Why am I here? And they're dead. It's just the luck of the draw with a dossier coin. It was a forgotten war, and now it's coming to the fore. But I still remember, still remember them. Bill Hall, 92, who'll be marching with the Black Watch Association later on after the service here at the Cenotaph. The members of the armed forces, the civilian services, continuing to take their place. They have to be patient. They stay here for an hour and a half, two hours before they're able to march past, whatever the weather. In London today, it's a slight drizzle, but it's not heavy rain. But they stand there, a few umbrellas going up, They'll be able to see and take part in the service before the march passed. The band's coming into position, the Royal Navy and the band of the Royal Marines, the Royal Navy lining up on one side of the cenotaph. Many of those who are on parade will have seen active service in Iraq and Afghanistan themselves. And they'll be here for the reason that they want to celebrate, remember, some private connection to the act of remembrance. And one of them is Captain Joseph Main. He's with Sophie Rayworth. He is indeed. Captain Joseph Min, you have a very particular, poignant reason for, for being here today. You're a serving member of the armed forces, but your father was killed, wasn't he, when you were just five years old, a tornado pilot, pilot in Iraq? Yeah. Yeah, so he was um, deployed in operations in Iraq in 2003, um, where he was uh, unfortunately killed in action, um, alongside his uh, navigator, uh, David Williams, 510 David Williams. Um, so, yeah, I, I lost him at a very early age. Yeah. What does it mean to you to be here today? It means... Uh, it means uh, it's, it's very special to be here, um, you know, as a serving member and uh, to honour the memory of my father. Uh, but it's also special to remember the people who, um, who have lost their lives in the service, as well as the people who have been wounded and have come back with um, all sorts of horrors from war. Um, but also the families as well, um, the families of people who never came back. It's, uh, it's important we remember and put our arm around those people today. It's a very, very important member of the day for the families, isn't it? And you, when you speak about your father's death, you say that in one sense it wasn't a negative impact on your life. It's actually given you a sense of drive, a yes. sense of purpose. Explain yes, that. so it's, 
it's obviously a, a, a tragedy for it to happen in the first place, but it's given me that drive that I needed to uh, succeed in life and um, to be the best I can be, uh, in, you know, to honour his memory and um, also the support my mum gave me um, from a very young age. It's, it's important that I do the absolute best I can to, to be who I am today and uh, working hard uh, going through Sandhurst and getting into the army was uh, a big part of, uh, you know, I can thank him to say that he drove me to that. And when you look around at all these faces, I always find it extraordinary. There's the, the stories, the history, so the much, gathering yeah. people. It's, a, it's an incredible atmosphere, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, the, the amount of experience that's just here today and um, everyone that's come along to support them as well. It's, uh, it's brilliant to see and it's good to have the support. Captain Joseph Main, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, thank you. Joseph Main with Sophie. One of Britain's most recent major military engagements followed the destruction in 2001 of the World Trade Center in New York when Britain joined the United States and their allies in war against the Taliban in Afghanistan. That war lasted 20 years and in that time 150,000 British personnel served. Nearly 500 of them died. Among them Lance Corporal Liam Tasker of the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, whose mother and sister recall his life. He was known as BLT, Big Liam Tasker. Liam was into mischief all the time. Dad actually made a joke once that the rest of us were surplus to requirement because Liam was the favorite. He joined the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers when he was 16. He loved the army, didn't he? He also had a love for the dogs, so he trained to be a dog handler. That was his passion, he loved it, didn't he? Yeah. Liam and Theo got put together, they just seemed to hit it off from day one. They had the record for the most fines IEDs at the time in Afghanistan. Lie right down, good boy. I was so proud of them. I didn't realise the danger of what they were doing. It was something that I'd grown up with. They came home in January. I don't know if it was instinct or something there. And I gave him a big hug and I was saying to him, you know, I was really worried about leaving him. And he said, don't be stupid, Mum. I'll be home in six weeks. 1st of March, 2011. The Padre and that had been trying to get hold of me. I went, it's Liam, isn't it? And he went, yeah. She was wailing. I've never heard a scream like it. I was sitting and I remember having my fingers in my ears. When we got told Liam had been killed, Theo was still alive at the time. And the Padre came back about three hours later and he said to me, we've got some sad news for you. Theo was just had an unexplained seizure and he sadly passed. I will say Theo died a broken heart. This is a letter that Liam wrote to us in case anything happened. I've had a fantastic life. I've got the best family in the world. You'll always be in my heart and I'll see you on the other side. My love for heaven and all was Liam. A man will travel many miles while chasing his dreams. And by God, I believe Liam did these miles and chased his dreams. We asked for Theo's ashes to be repatriated. I took a lot of comfort in the fact that they were going to be together. Theo's actually at his feet with him. Yeah. Liam got his mention in dispatches for his bravery the year after. He loved what he was doing. I was so proud of what he did and what he gave. Liam was 26 when he was killed and Nicola turned 26 in March. I thought, God, she's just a kid. It's difficult, but... And then to know that you'll be older than your older sibling, obviously, isn't nice. People seem to think time heals. Time doesn't heal. That's why Remembrance Day and things like that are really important to us, because you don't want your child to be forgotten.
time doesn't heal. Well, I'm joined by Andy Allen, who is marching for the third time today. It's a particularly difficult day, isn't it, today, for the families who, who, who have lost people, those particularly recently? I mean, certainly, families never forget. And on days like this, it, it really does heighten the sensitivities to it all. Um, it is a time to remember, uh, and for families, it just brings it all back, and it's, it's very raw, very raw indeed. You're marching with uh, with Remi, the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. Yes, I am. What does it mean to you to be here today? For me, it, it connects the dots. Um, the Caribbean sort of fought in the First World War, and they fought in the Second World War. And there's generations like myself that have gone through. And so we've got to connect the dots from the past to the present and to the future. And it is all about making sure that there is a history, making sure that people know, making sure people remember that British Caribbeans actually did fight for queen and country and for king and country throughout the period. The Commonwealth soldiers lost their lives and in huge oh. numbers just in World War One and World War Two alone. It's like one and a half million more than that. A absolutely. And that history, that that knowledge needs to be recognised and, it, and it's coming through now. And that Commonwealth sacrifice they wanted to give to the country. And we mustn't forget that. And on days like this, the nation really gets it. They really do see us all marching, not just for the Commonwealth, but it is for the whole nation. And your father was of the Windrush generation. Yes, he was, yeah. You yourself in the 1980s went to Sandhurst. You were really breaking the mould then, weren't you? Uh, Sophie, when I went to Sandhurst in 1984, I was black British only officer cadet at Sandhurst. I mean, there were prior other intakes. Um, so yes, I was, <laughs> I was breaking the mould, Sophie, yeah. And being here today, the camaraderie amongst all the veterans who, who are lining up now? Oh, it, it, uh, the ban let me tell you, the, the banter that is going on in between, between the old soldiers and, and actually some young soldiers is marvellous. And it does help the healing mm -hmm. over time. These types of occasions make people remember comrades, but also the get-together and the banter is just fantastic. Andy Allen, thank you so much. Andy Allen there. And if you're just joining us in Whitehall, this morning's ceremony will begin shortly. The bands will be playing the traditional music. And after that, at 11 o'clock, the two minute silence. And then the king laying a wreath on behalf of the nation. We'll be live on air here on BBC One until 12.45. Meanwhile, you can find audio described commentary for the blind and partially sighted via the red button and iPlayer and uninterrupted commentary free coverage is also available on the iPlayer. So here, with the RAF in position, the hollow square is now almost complete. The hollow square, originally a fighting formation, but also a formation dating back centuries, echoing the drumhead ceremony when soldiers on the battlefield would parade on the three sides of a hollow square before going into battle. And the fourth side, roughly where the cenotaph is today, would be piled with drums, you may have seen it at the Festival of Remembrance last night at the Albert Hall, to make an altar, and that would be draped with regimental colors for the service. The Household Cavalry, dismounted regiment of the Blues and Royals, who formed the King's Lifeguard. The 1st Battalion Welsh Guards are here forming the Guard of Honour, led by William Harris, himself has seen service in Afghanistan. Blues and Royals led by Captain Stone. Royal Air Force, represented by, among others, the King's Colour Squadron, 63 Squadron, the RAF Regiment and Princess Mary's Royal Air Force Nursing Service and the RAF led by Squadron Leader Bull, who played an active part in the evacuation of Afghanistan in 2021. And then the uniformed civilian services. A long list, the Fleet Auxiliary, the Coast Guard, the police, British Transport Police, Fire and Rescue, Ambulance, British Red Cross, Prison and Probation Services, Northern Ireland Prison Service, and the Women's Voluntary Service. And then there are over 100 representatives of the Royal Navy, representing all arms of the service, the 
surface flotilla, the submarine fleet, the fleet air arm, the Royal Marines, 4-2 Commando, and the Queen Alexandra Naval Nursing Service, led by Lieutenant Commander Geoffrey Howells. The sailors from all kinds of ships, Heron, Seahawk, Drake, Excellent, Collingwood, Raleigh, I can't name them all. And the 42 Commando Royal Marines and the Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service. The bands from form the south side here, drawn from the band and buglers of the Royal Marines, the mass bands of the Household Division, pipes of the 1st Battalion, Irish Guards, the Trumpeters, and the Central Band of the Royal Air Force, led by Lieutenant Colonel David Barringer, the commanding officer of the band. Britannia, followed by Heart of Oak, and now the minstrel boy to the war is gone.
Senior Drum Major Gareth Chambers orders the mass bands to stand at ease and the music is taken up by the pipes of the 1st Battalion Irish Guards and the Skyboat Song. Next, Isle of Beauty, a 19th century song with the words, Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Isle of Beauty, fare thee well. Oft in the stilly night, the poet remembers the friends I've seen around me fall like leaves in wintry weather. It was first played when George V unveiled the Cenotaph in 1920, and on that year he made a pilgrimage to the continent to see the battlefields and the cemeteries of the First World War, saying that he asked himself whether there could be any more powerful advocate for peace than these massed multitudes of silent witnesses to the desolation of war.
The pipes and drums now play Flowers of the Forest, which was part of the service at Westminster Abbey in 1920 for the Unknown Warrior. It's been played every year since then. Perhaps the most famous of Elgar's Enigma variations, always played here at the Cenotaph, Nimrod, depiction of friendship and comradeship.
when I am laid in earth, remember me, but ah, uh, forget my fate. Dido's Lament. Playing as we wait for the procession of clergy and choir, who will lead the Bishop of London, Dame Sarah Mullally, out for their part in the service. General's procession. Major General James Bowder of London District, the General Officer Commanding, the Chief of Staff Colonel Stone, and the ADC Captain Brewer. Rishi Sunak, leader of the Labour Party, Scottish National Party, the Liberal Democrats, Democratic Unionists, the Speaker of the House of Commons and of the House of Lords, and many members of the government, and former Prime Ministers with them. They're followed by representatives of the Crown Dependencies and UK Overseas Territories, Guernsey, Jersey, the Isle of Man, Anguilla, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, the Falklands, Gibraltar, Montserrat, St. Helena, Ascension and Tristan de Huna, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. And then the Chief of the Defence Staff, the First Sea Lord, the Chief of the General Staff, and the Chief of the Air Staff. Admiral Sir Tony Radican, Admiral Sir Ben Key, General Sir Patrick Sanders, and Air Chief Marshal Sir Richard Knighton. And with them, the Merchant Navy and Fishing Fleet representative, Geoffrey Nutt, William Lead of the Air Transport Auxiliary Association, Gavin Stevens for the Civilian Services. And now the nearly 50 High Commissioners from the Commonwealth countries, the, the equivalent of ambassadors in effect, including the older members of the Commonwealth, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, Pakistan, members from East Africa and the Caribbean. Most of these countries, even the smallest, sent men to fight and women to fight in one or both of the two world wars. Just a few of the recent members 
of the Commonwealth, Gabon, Togo, Rwanda, Mozambique, who are here, didn't have any links with Britain during those first two wars. Over, over 20 representatives of many different faiths and beliefs take their place. And at with at three minutes or so to go before 11 o'clock. Everyone is now in their place, except for the members of the Royal Party. His Majesty the King, followed by the Prince of Wales, Prince Edward, Duke of Edinburgh, the Princess Royal, and their equerries, with a minute until 11 o'clock come to take their place to salute and later to lay the first of the wreaths.
Majesty the King laying the first wreath on behalf of the nation. The second wreath is laid on behalf of the Queen by uh, equerry Major Plunkett. The Prince of Wales steps forward with his wreath. Prince Edward, Duke of Edinburgh. <coughs> and Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. And a wreath now laid on behalf of the Duke of Kent, who's not here this year, by his equerry, Captain Hopkins. Now the leaders of the political parties, beginning with the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Starmer, leader of the Labour Party. Stephen Flynn, leader of the Scottish National Party in the House of Commons, laying a wreath on behalf of the SNP and of Plaid Cymru.
Sir Ed Davey, leader of the Liberal Democrats. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson for the Democratic Unionist Party. Speaker of the House of Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. And he is followed by the Speaker of the House of Lords. Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, James Cleverly, and the Secretary of State for the Home Department, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, laying wreaths on behalf of the intelligence agencies, the Security Service, Government Communications Headquarters at GCHQ. Crown dependencies and UK overseas territories now from Guernsey, Jersey, the Isle of Man, Anguilla, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, the Falkland Islands, Gibraltar, Montserrat, St Helena, Ascension and Tristan de Huna and the Turks and Caicos Islands. the High Commissioners of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Sri Lanka, Ghana and Malaysia.
followed by the High Commissioners of Nigeria, Cyprus, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, and usually Kenya would be here, but they're not here today. 45,000 men from British East Africa lost their lives in the war. All these countries played a part. followed by the High Commissioners of Malawi, of Malta, the George Cross Island, of Zambia, the Gambia, Singapore, Guyana, Botswana, Lesotho, and Barbados. The contributions of many of the countries in Africa not well recorded, unlike those of soldiers from Britain and the old Commonwealth. Very often not given a grave, just buried, and even now, many, many years later, they're still trying to identify how many people gave their lives in the First and Second World War. Eswatini, the former Swaziland, Fiji, Bangladesh, the Bahamas, Grenada, Papua New Guinea, the Seychelles, the Commonwealth of Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. The final group of High Commissioners from Belize, Antigua and Barbuda, the Maldives, St. Christopher and Nevis, Brunei Dar es Salaam, Namibia, Camer Cameroon, Mozambique, Rwanda, Gabon, and Togo. Remembering 15,000 soldiers from West Indies regiments from the Caribbean who saw action in France and Palestine and Egypt and Italy during the First World War. Two and a half thousand died. And the High Commissioners are followed by the Ambassador of Ireland, Martin Fraser, and the Ambassador of Nepal, by Ann Chandra Acharya, laying a wreath on behalf of the Gurkhas who fought so valiantly and still do today in World War I, II. Service Chiefs, Chief of the Defence Staff and the First Sea Lord, Chief of the General Staff and the Chief of the Air Staff.
the all-important representatives of the merchant navy who played such a vital role in the Second World War in keeping Britain supplied, of the Air Transport Auxiliary Association of the Civilian Services, Geoffrey Nutt, William Lead, and Chief Constable Gavin Stevens. And that marks the end of the formal wreath laying and the beginning of the service with the Bishop of London. O oh, almighty God, grant we beseech thee that we who here do honour to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country and of the crown may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude that forgetting all selfish and unworthy motives we may live only to thy glory and to the service of mankind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to speak for rest, to labour and not to ask for any award save that of knowing that we do thy will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen.
the Queen leaving the balcony where she was watching as her wreath was laid and the royal party leaving the cenotaph at Whitehall, going back into the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And they'll be followed by all the others who came out for this, including, you may have spotted, a host of former Prime Ministers, John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, and Liz Truss all here. But first, the religious procession leaves. Well, as they leave Whitehall and next will be the wreath laying by the Royal British Legion and their representatives, let's rejoin Sophie Rayworth. Well, I'm joined by a very special gentleman here. He is one of just 12 or so World War II veterans. This is Bernard Madden, 101 years old. Yeah. And this is your third time here at the Cenotaph, isn't it? What's it like here for you when you come back here? Emotional. You didn't come, did you, until you were in your mid-80s, until you were about 85? Yeah. And what was, what was it? You found it very overwhelming, didn't you? Yeah. It was, uh, <clears throat> I walked it. You walked it then? Yeah. You've got your lovely granddaughter here who's going to be yeah. taking you today. Now, you're marching with the Green Howards, aren't you? Yeah. And uh, tell us, I want to, you've got your medals with you, but you've also got yeah. some history that you're bringing with you, which is wonderful to see, because yeah. that is a photograph of you, Bernard, isn't it? Yeah. I hope people at home can see that. Yeah. You were 21 years old. Not round about that. <laughs> that was 80 years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. 80 or 90, years ago. one of the two. And you fought in Burma, didn't you? Yeah. And something here which you've got as well with you is extraordinary. A passenger ticket there. Hmm? The passenger ticket yeah. that you have here, which was from 1946. Do you remember that journey home? That was yeah, when you left it, Burma. Yeah, it was in the Liberator bomber. An American. An American yeah. bomber. Bomber. And then we switched to an English liberator. Amazing, it's such a long time and ago. That was in 46 when I was getting demobbed. And you have been getting an awful lot of attention here today, haven't you? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not used to it. <laughs> but everyone wants to come and talk to you, don't yeah. they? They all want to come yeah, and shake yeah, your of hand. Course. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Emotional. You see, it brings back the memories when we were going on. Um, what, what do you call it? On, um, it must just bring back a lot of memories, I think. Yeah, just my the... my uh, memories and all that good. But what gets me is going back to when we were in Burma and some of the lads never got home. Mm. Is that who you think about when you go past yeah, the cemetery? Yeah. Because they fought for the country and they never came back. And it, it, it was terrible when somebody comes up to me and say, oh, you know, it could be Joe. Joe didn't make it, and it really hurt. Mm. Mm, you remember that vividly all these years later. Yeah. Well, Bernard, you're going to be leading the column for the Green Howards, aren't you, with your granddaughter? Yeah. It's, a, it's amazing to see you here. Thank you yeah. so much for being here, and thank oh. you so much for talking to us. Yeah. Thank you. What is it? official ceremony, so to speak, is concluded now and the Royal British Legion in effect 
takes over the events here. They organize the march past. And they represent all the veterans' charities that are here. And first of all, they lay wreaths, the first one by the President of the Royal British Legion, Vice Admiral Sir Clive Johnson. Johnson took over presidency of the British Legion in May this year. This comes from a family that served in the Royal Navy and the Army over many generations. He retired as a Vice Admiral from his final role as Commander of NATO's Allied Maritime Command in 2019. The Royal British Legion, on whose behalf these, that wreath was laid, is the, actually the largest of all the UK charities devoted to supporting the armed forces communities. And they organised this march past. They also organised Poppy Day. The next wreath is laid by Keith Ridley of the Royal Naval Association. He joined the Royal Navy when he was 16 and has been chairman for the last seven years. And like all the associations we'll be hearing about during the March Pass, the Royal Naval Association is there to keep former sailors across the world in touch with each other, give help where they can. Sir James Everard on behalf of the Army Benevolent Fund, the Soldiers' Charity, as it's called. He took over as president of this after a long career in the Army. He was in the 17th, 21st Lancers, commanded the Queen's Royal Lancers. 20th Army Brigade, served in the Pentagon all over the place. And now, Air Commodore Stu Stirrett, on behalf of the Royal Air Forces Association. He was a helicopter pilot, retired this year after 38 years. He served in Northern Ireland, Iraq, Afghanistan, and now devotes himself to the work of the RAF Association, again providing support for former members of the services. General Lord Richards, Lord David Richards, of Hurstmonceau, Grand President is called of the Royal Commonwealth Ex Services League, and a former Chief of the Defence Staff, distinguished military career. He was commissioned in the Royal Artillery, commanded the 3rd Regiment, Royal Horse Artillery. He's commanded in Afghanistan in July 2006. And he'll be joining the 3rd Regiment, Royal Horse Artillery during, during the march past later. And now, Lieutenant Commander Martin Hawthorne on behalf of the Royal British Legion Scotland. A wreath with a saltire. He was an instructor in the Royal Navy. Served on all kinds of ships, Fearless and Hermes and Zulu and Glasgow. And the Royal British Legion Scotland has nearly 140 branches and clubs all over Scotland. 20,000 members, again, looking after ex-servicemen. And now Brian Everett lays a wreath on behalf of 
Transport for London, president of the London Transport Old, Com Old Comrades Association since 1992. Remember the bus drivers were brought here by George V in 1920 because they'd worked during the war taking troops to the front and he thought they should be recognized as well as the military. The King's Wreath there at the foot of the Cenotaph. And in a moment, the veterans who are gathered here in Whitehall will start marching past the Cenotaph and past the Cenotaph down round into Parliament Square and onto Horse Guards, where the salute is taken by the Princess Royal. Now, many of them have, of course, come here before, but each year there are newcomers spanning generations. This year, for instance, there's a 99-year-old World War II veteran, Alec Penstone, and a 36-year-old James Rose, who served in Afghanistan. Both of them marching for the first time, and this is why. The reason I joined the military in the first place was because my brother joined before me. When I joined, I was 20-year-old. We were deployed to Afghanistan in September 2009. I wasn't on a deployment list to go. I went in, told the Sergeant Major that I wanted to go. I always remember when the plane landed. Um, I kind of aged about 10 years straight away because everything just felt real. And I just said to myself, what, <laughs> what am I doing here? On 10th of November, just a normal routine patrol. I was at the front of the metal detector, clearing the route and got this gut feeling. Took one more step. And that's when he had a click. The IED kind of blasted me into the air, about five or 10 meters. Everything was silent and all you can hear is like a bee. I remember just waking up in Birmingham then. At the time, I didn't really know my injuries. I kind of like sat up in bed and just went like that straight away and just went, oh, I've got no legs. I was injured the day before, Remembrance Day, so it kind of brings everything back. I get flashbacks every single day of the week, but I kind of know how to deal with them flashbacks and how to deal with the, the thoughts now. Marching past the cenotaph, I have been asked in the past, but I was in a bad place. I think I'm ready to do it this year. Just being around people who have been in your situation, it's massively comforting. For me, it's a time to reflect and acknowledge like the sacrifices people have took in the past and continue to do so. I'm now 98 years old, and to take part in the March Pass would be the icing on the cake. To be able to pay my respects to all those that have gone before me and done so much for this country, including my dad. The reason I carry on selling poppies is because the British Legion was so kind to my father when he was dying. He got severely wounded in the Second Battle of the Somme. My father died five months before the Second World War started. I'd already promised him I wouldn't go in the trenches. I actually joined the Royal Navy just before I was 18. I felt I was doing my bit for the country, honouring his name as well. And I started off on the Arctic convoys. 
we were attacked constantly from the air and we could hear the explosions when ships of the convoy were hit by a torpedo. We were very, very lucky that we escaped. Thank you for your that, service. Yeah. I'm a very, very lucky one. Aww. I've managed to survive the war, but this country would not exist if it hadn't been for the dedication of all those hundreds of thousands of people that now lay in France or other places. It all stays so fresh in my mind. This would be my last wish, to be able to walk past the cenotaph and pay my respects to all those that have gone before me. Alec Penston, who's 99, is going to be here today and says it's the icing on the cake. And James Rose, the young man before him, both taking part in this march past. The band of the Coldstream Guards will lead off the trustees of the British Legion at the front of the parade. And then we begin with the Gurkha Brigade Association. One word about this. It's often mistaken and thought that this is a military parade, people marching under their regimental banner, so to speak. But it's not. It's a parade of associations who represent the regiments. The associations who look after those who've been in war, who need help. So these are charitable and support organizations. They're not marching when we say the Blues and Royals or the 1st Battalion or whatever it is. It's not a military parade for them. This is a civilian parade. It's led off by the Gurkha Brigade Association today and the British Gurkha Welfare Society. 40 Gurkha battalions who fought in World War II. Selected from Nepal, from young men living in the hills of Nepal. And the Gurkha Brigade Association, their officers primarily in the front. before you'll know the familiar pattern of the various contingents come past and each hands a wreath which is laid at the foot of the cenotaph. And now behind the Gurkhas, the Grenadier Guards, the Coldstream Guards, the Scots Guards, the Irish Guards, the Welsh Guards, the London Regiment Association and the Guards Parachute Association. Parachute Association. They were employed in very dangerous work, falling into enemy territories. And they're followed by the Royal Regiment of Scotland, the Royal Scots Regimental Association, the King's Own Borderers, and here the Black Watch Association, their blue bonnets with the red hackle. Bill Hall, who we saw earlier, is marching there among them. They're followed by the Queen's Own Highlanders Regimental Association. The Fraser Macduff and North East Gordon Highlanders, the Gordon Highlanders London Association. Gary, being worn by the Regimental Association of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders.
Queen's Regiment, the senior English Line Infantry Regiment, merged with the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment. Many of these regiments marching past have been merged and merged and merged again, of course, as the army has shrunk in size from somewhere around quarter of a million in the 60s to 60,000 or so today. The Green Howards. Arthur Oborn, who landed on D-Day, 98 marching past with them. So the Yorkshire regiments, Prince of Wales' own, the Green Howards, the Cheshires, the Royal Welsh, the Worcestershire and Sherwood Foresters, the Staffordshire Regiment, the Regimental Association, the Royal Irish, the Combined Irish Regiments, Ulster Defence Regiment. Parachute Regiment Association in their red, or rather maroon berets again, formed by Winston Churchill in 1940. They were preceded by the combined Irish regiments and followed by the Rifles Office, the Light Infantry, and the Durham Light Infantry, and the Rifles and Royal Gloucestershire, Berkshire, Wiltshire Regimental Association, Royal Gloucesters, some of them wearing the black beret. Glorious Gloucesters for their role in the infamous or famous, I should say, Battle of Imjin River in the Korean War. Many of them became prisoners of war. They won three VCs. They're followed by the Rifles Regimental Association, Green jackets, wearing the green uniform, designed to make them less visible on the battlefield. And famously, March, I don't know whether you've ever tried this at 140 paces a minute. Not quite so fast this morning. Association Veterans Army, those are people marching, not attached to a particular regiment, but just marching here because they fought in the war, or they're retired servicemen. British Limbless Ex-Servicemen's Association, BLESMA, preceded by Combat Stress, an organization set up for those with shell shock. James Rose, who we saw a moment ago in the film, who served in Afghanistan, and uh, has since climbed Kilimanjaro. The British Ex-Services Wheelchair Sports Association,
Wheelchair Sports Association, led by Edmund Thomas, founded in the late 80s to support wheelchair sports. Care for veterans following a hospital home in Worthing and the, and the blind veterans, the wreath being carried by Dennis Smith, 97 years old, fought in the Green Howards in 1944, served throughout Northwest Europe in World War II, discharged from the army in 1948. The blind veterans, some of them with their guide dogs, some being assisted by their friends or colleagues. Hospital Chelsea, the Chelsea pensioners, British Army veterans go there in return for giving up their pension. Live together pretty well under the discipline of military service and the Royal Star and Garter homes who used to be in Richmond. The Royal Logistic Corps. Corps of Transport, they're the professional logician, the logis, lo, lo, I can't say the word, logisticians uh, who keep the army marching and the Ordnance Corps before them. The Royal Dragoon Guards, now a multi row armoured cavalry regiment. They're preceded by the Royal Scots Dragoons, the Blues and Royals Association, the Household Cavalry that is, and the Lifeguards Association, and followed by the Queen's Royal Hussars, the Royal Lancers, the 16th, 5th Queen's Royal Lancers, 17th, 21st Lancers, the Death or Glory Boys, King's Royal Hussars and the Light Dragoons. And so this procession goes past. Many, many more to come. But just for a moment, let's join Sophie. I'm here with two people who are going to be marching with Scotty's Little Soldiers, the charity set up for bereaved military children. They only started taking part for the first time in 2019. And I'm here with Lennon Palin and his mother, Carla Palin, and they're here for the first time. Your father, Mark, he was killed, wasn't he, in Afghanistan in 2011. Yeah. What does it mean to you to be here today? It brings me a lot of proudness to represent him as a person and the good things he'd done for serving our country. There are 46 children marching with you today. The youngest is eight. You've met some of them already. What's it like meeting other children like that? Um, it makes me feel sad because although I, was, I lost my dad at a young age, um, seeing children that young losing their dad, it just, just makes me feel sad. You were only one, weren't you, when yeah, your father died? Yeah. And being here today now, I mean, the atmosphere is amazing, isn't it? Yes, I spoke to some people and they're just, yeah, they're just feeling happy for us and, yeah. And Carla, it's particularly difficult for you today, isn't it? I mean, I know you've, yeah. you've thought about coming here many times, but it's Mark's birthday today, it is isn't today, it? He would yeah. have been 45. Yeah. Yes, it's his birthday today, but as always, it, you know, it lands with remembrance. So as a family, we just 
remember and carry on. And you're here with your daughter as well, aren't you? I am, you? Ruby, yeah. For, for you as a family, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be an extraordinary moment, isn't it? Yeah, past very, season. very proud. Um, proud of my children, proud of their dad, proud of everyone that served the country. Yeah, I think your father would be very proud of you, young man. Yes. OK, well, we'll leave you to take your places. Thank you both very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll see them later, Scotty's little heroes. The Royal Signals Association, marching past now, followed by the Army Air Corps Association. It is, of course, impossible to list every contingent that's marching here, and that's not the point of the march past. The point of the march past is that all these veterans have come from all the corners of the armed services and from all the corners of the world to remember those that were killed in war and to mark once again each year the service that they and their comrades played. So forgive me if there are contingents going past who aren't identified. As I say, the identification is not the point. The point is the 10,000 veterans who've come here today on Remembrance Sunday to commemorate those two wars and the wars that followed. The Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers there. Andy Allen, who came, there he is on the right of your screen, whose father came with the Windrush generation and was the first can, uh, cadet of colour at Sandhurst, talking earlier on to Sophie about how proud he was to be here today. And with a host of medals on his chest. Army dog unit from Northern Ireland with the dog's leads around their shoulders. Military working dogs and a red paw headdress and a red paw on the wreath. Dogs who used to work in bomb blasted areas searching for casualties and blooded their paws as a result, hence that mark on the wreath that they lay at the cenotaph. Here we have the Royal Military Police here, the Pay Corps, the Intelligence Corps, the Physical Training Corps, Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps the Women's Royal Army Corps. Royal Military Police Association. And the Scarlet Berets. Marching here in the contingent of the Royal Air Force Survival Equipment, 
Roy Farmer, 99 year old, World War II veteran, ditched when his Sunderland flying boat caught fire off the West African coast. And the Survival Equipment Association provided parachutes and life saving injection seats, life preservers, and all the rest for the Royal Air Force. The Mountain Rescue Association is here too. The Linguist Association. The Women's Royal Air Force, Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and Women in the RAF Association. Watson served 30 years in the Women's Royal Air Force. First recruited into the Air Force in 1918 and then disbanded after the First World War and came back for the Second World War. service caps, the Royal Air Force Police Association, the snowdrops as they're called. And as I said earlier, they come, these processions come round down to the bottom of Whitehall and then round to a saluting base. And the salute is taken here by the Princess Royal. And with her, Grant Shapps, the Secretary for Defence, and Vice Admiral Johnson, National President of the Royal British Legion. So that this is, in that sense, a a semi-military parade because the salute is taken at the end of it. And for many of these veterans, it's a long walk. They've been waiting an hour and a half or more on Whitehall and then come down and round and back. It's another quarter of an hour or so before they come to the saluting base. Sea Rescue and Marine Crafts sections of the Royal Air Force with their white roll neck sea sweaters. Standard rig during the war at sea. And in front of them were the Royal Air Force ex-prisoners of war, mainly here today those shot down and taken prisoner during the first Gulf War. The eviction of Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Princess Mary's Royal Air Force Nursing Service Association, sky blue scarves that they wear, formed in 1918.
and the Women's Royal Air Force Association. Canopy Club Association, parachute jumpers who served in the British military, led by squadron leader Reed and the Royal Air Forces Association Armourers Branch. And the important job of maintaining and loading aircraft bombs. Technical Training School, RAF Locking, opened in the beginning of the Second World War. And before then, the trade group, the 8th Squadron Association, 1370 Global Branch of the RAF Force Association, 84 Squadron Association, the Flight Engineers, the Medical Services Trades, the Royal Air Forces, Caduceus Branch. And 31 Squadron Association, formed in 1915. First aircraft squadron to operate in India on the northwest frontier. Their motto is first in the Indian skies in Chalum Indicum Primus, if you want it in Latin. Now the fourth column coming down from Whitehall, led by the British West India Regiment Heritage Trust. And remembering again the arrival of Windrush 75 years ago, which brought back many people who'd fought in the Second World War and then came back to help reconstruct Britain after the war. Behind them, the LGBT plus organization Fighting with Pride, which interestingly has its wreath layers walking at the back, not in front, to allow the veterans who have been forcibly dismissed from the service to walk at the front. Scotty's little soldiers, we were hearing from one of them with Sophie just before. Scotty's little soldiers, a nine-year-old laying the wreath. These are children of those killed in war. And it was formed because it was felt that they had needed, had a right and needed to be here. So that it wouldn't just be the parents or brothers and sisters of the bereaved, but the children as well. The organization looks after them and gives them support and presents at Christmas. The British nuclear test veterans, they're always here, remembering those who either killed during the testing of nuclear weapons 
in the 50s and 60s or died from the effects afterwards. And the legacy of the atomic bomb and recognition for atomic test survivors. They were awarded last year the nuclear test medal, many of them for their service, which they're wearing for the first time, the medals. Followed by the Commando Veterans, the Italia Star, Italy Star Association, with a 99-year-old veteran. Extraordinary, the number of 9,900, 98-year-olds who are still making it here this year, and many of them coming regularly, some just coming for the first time. Help for Heroes, this was the organization, the charity that was founded during the war in Afghanistan, the 20-year war in Afghanistan, to help those who were injured, disabled, did terrific work, raised a lot of money, supports 27,000 veterans, and not just people with physical illness, but many people, as we now know, who have problems with mental health in the future, something that was until recently perhaps rather less prominent in the charitable sector, but now very important. The Spirit of Normandy Trust, the anniversary of the Normandy League, the Monte Cassino Society, the Burma Star Memorial Fund, the Chindits, the Australian in their bush hats, Chindit Society, 98 years old, the wreath there. The two 98-year-olds in that Chindit march past. The National Malaya and Borneo Veterans Association. The uprising in Malaya after the Second World War, which didn't end until 1960, often forgotten. And the Gallantry Medalist League, the oldest association for gallantry in the United Kingdom. from before, talking about coming here and at the salute as he goes past. The Kazovac Club. Casualty evacuation for those seriously wounded in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was created especially for those who had injuries and scars that had been forgotten in civilian life and needed special help. Casualty evacuation, Kazovac. The National Gulf Veterans and Families Association was before them. The canteen service, the Polish contingent. The medical emergency response team. Metropolitan Police, Armed Forces Veterans. They're all military veterans on parade today who've gone on to join the police subsequently, wearing their police uniforms. Crucial Oman Scouts, red and white shimans with a black rope, a ghoul there. Crucial Oman Scouts established by the British in the early 50s to keep 
peace in what are now called the United Arab Emirates. I don't know whether we'll see them, but the Dutch are always here. The Bon van Werpenbroeders, who, like the members of Polish Air Force or regiments, come here despite not being in the Commonwealth. There are veterans of the Czech Republic marching here. So it's not just the UK and the Commonwealth, but here in the March past, a few groups. They're not, of course, the you know, major force of the United States who helped win the war, but those who came from Europe, some of them, Holland, Czech Republic, Poland. And now the Royal Naval Association, Robert Hardy, the 98-year-old veteran who served in the Battle of the Atlantic, marching with his two grandsons, and a 102-year-old veteran, Bernard Golding, marching here. Merchant Navy Association. Merchant Navy Association represents the 50,000 or more seafarers who died at sea and not buried on land, had no grave. And in recognition of the role of the Merchant Navy, the Red Ensign is the only civilian flag that flies on the cenotaph, on the other side from the picture you'll see there. And this is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Atlantic, which provided food and munitions and troops to Europe from across the Atlantic. The Air Crewmen's Association is here, the Art Royal Association, probably the oldest named ship in uh, the Royal Navy. It was the flagship at the Armada in 1588. white anchor of the Merchant Navy Association. So we have the submariners passing through, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, the Association of Wrens, the Merchant Navy Association, the Fisgard Association, Ganges, the medical branch of the Navy. And as they go past, let's just for a moment rejoin Sophie on horse guards. Well, this is what happens after the march past. Everyone gathers here on Horse Guards Parade. The stories told, a lot of chat, a lot of banter, a lot of memories exchanged. I'm joined by Caroline Whitaker, who is a 
taken part for the first time, haven't you? That's right. Um, and you served with the army, and you were in Iraq. That's correct. 20 years ago yes. at the start of the Iraq yes. war. You were running a, a big field hospital there. That's right, 202 Field Hospital. What was it like for you today when you took part for the first time? Oh, it's just been absolutely wonderful to be back with all the sort of military ethos again, military people, and I've met some people today that I haven't seen for years. So it's been really wonderful, you know, just to be part of this. That's what people often say, it's about the connections, Oh, absolutely. It? I think for a lot of veterans it's about being with people who they can really talk to very openly, can't they? Yes, you relate straight away. As soon as you're in the military, you know, it's the sort of comradeship through and through, really. And you remember what people have been through, you know, what they've served, the sacrifices they've given, and that's what you remember coming here. And when you went past the Cenotaph for a very short time ago, who did you think of? Um, all the wonderful people that I serve with uh, in, in civilian life, but also when I serve on operations, and the skill and service that they give, that's what I think about. And it, a very emotional moment, isn't oh, it? It's very, very highly charged. Yes, very much so. And now, afterwards, you can exchange your memories. You have a lo lovely stories that people tell, isn't it, aren't there? Oh, yes, lovely. Uh, and it's, it's, just, it's just wonderful to, to be with people I haven't seen for so long. Um, and many of them are still serving, of course, but many have retired. And, and we forget with veterans how much they have done for the country. Uh, so a, a service like this to come to is just wonderful. Karen Muska, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much. Fleet Air Arm Association just passing through the Fleet Air Arm Buccaneer Association, the Air Arm Field Gun. It's interesting, they competed in the field gun competition. This is the kind of organization that gets people to stick together. They used to be at the World Tournament, and well, after the war, but reassembling and jumping guns over barricades and all that had stopped now, but anyway, they still march together. The Fighting G Club, the Gloucester Survivors Association, they were preceded by HMS Tiger, Illustrious, Hermes, Bulwark, Glorious, the Tun Class Association, County Glass Destroyers, the Naval Air Squadron, the Sea Harriers, Royal Naval Photographers, the Cloud Observers, and after them, HMS Exeter, Glasgow, the Type 21 frigates, the Type 42 frigates, the Lowestoft, HMS Lowestoft and Plymouth and Ardent, lost in May 1982. As President Lord West of Spithead, who was captain of Ardent in the Falklands, the Andromeda Association, the Argonaut, Scylla, the Ariadne, the Jupiter, Penelope, Broadsword, the Royal Naval Benevolent Trust, HMS St. Vincent Association. Now the, almost the final column, not quite the final column, marching past transport for London. saw a wreath laid on behalf of London Transport and explained then it was because many transport workers died in both world wars but also they were first recognized for driving troops to the front from the rear guard in the first world war led by Barry Osborne wreath laid by Brian Everett, who served in the Royal Air Force. Women's Royal Voluntary Services, an organization recognizing civilians killed in enemy action. The Royal Ulster Constabulary in their green blazers, the George Cross Association, recognized as the most dangerous police force in the world to serve in. 300 members of the IUC killed during the Troubles in Northern Ireland. 50 of them on parade today, led by Terence Chin. And they're followed by the National Association of 
retired police officers, the International Police Association, Metropolitan Special Constabulary, the British evacuees who were representing three and a half million children in the Second World War, Civil Defense Association, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, the reef being laid by Rich Hills, the director for Africa and Asia. They commemorate nearly two million Commonwealth servicemen and women who died during the two world wars. They look after graves in over 20,000 places in 150 countries. They were preceded by children of the Far East Prisoners of War, TOC H, the Gallipoli Association, First Aid Nursing Yeomanry follow them, and St. John Ambulance and the British Red Cross, and St. Andrew's First Aid. And behind them, the Munition Workers Association. One of them, Margaret Machen, has got the wreath. He is 100 years old. St. Andrew's First Aid. People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, the RSPCA, as well behind them. They were preceded by the Salvation Army, the Showman's Guild, the Union Jack Club. National Association of Round Tables of Great Britain, Corps of Commissioners, a company set up to give employment. Originally, interestingly, to people coming home from the war in the Crimea. Now the youth contingent, the sea cadets and the army cadets and the Royal Air Force cadets. boys and girls in school who go through military training, go to camp, learn to fly, don't necessarily go into the forces. The combined cadet force, many schools have a CCF, where pupils go and parade and learn how to fire a rifle and learn a bit about military service. There are even volunteer police cadets, volunteer fire cadets, and uh, St. John Ambulance, and the Scout Association, and Girl Guiding, and the Broyes Brigade is here, and the Girls Brigade, and the Church Lads, and the Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade, and the YMCA.
There's something a little unnerving after seeing so many veterans who fought in wars to see a whole new young generation marching past in their innocence. Who knows what fate and what future will await them in the world of today. But they mark the last marchers in this march past of nearly 10,000 people. The field of poppies around the cenotaph. As the final contingents pass the Senate out there on the right, let's just go to Horse Guards for a moment and join Sophie Rayworth. Well, it is really filling up here at Horse Guards Parade now. I'm joined by Mark Jewell, who marched with the RAF Survival Equipment Association, and by no means the first time for you. You've been here how many times now? Uh, 13 times now. And what brings you back year after year? Um, loyalty to my mates um, and to the people who've gone before us. Uh, and just getting people together with us and, and quite a few people say to me um, you just don't know what you've done for me to get me here it's, it's a, an enormous an emotional experience for us and thank you thank you for doing it you had uh, one one very special person with you today didn't you you have one of the very few world war ii veterans yes uh, we had a gentleman called roy farmelo who was a gold member of the goldfish club and he's 100 and he will celebrate his 101st birthday in january next year his son told me today that um, he will wake up tomorrow and say, are we ready for next year? So I'll be having that discussion with him sort of before Christmas and uh, we'll get him here next year if we can. I, I was talking to a World War II veteran earlier who was 101 and, and it was just wonderful to see the reaction he got from everybody yeah. around him. Everyone's queuing up to shake his hand. He absolutely loves it, he does. He's, he's, uh, he's a, real, a real dynamo really to be coming each year. He's been three times now. So we don't know whether he's going to make it each year, but obviously he's here again and he'll be wanting to come back next year. And you're very much a military family, aren't you? Your father, your grandfather, I think? Yes, my... Uh, and so your son. My son, myself, um, my grandfather. My grandfather's on both sides of the family. Uh, I've got aunts, great aunts, going all the way back that have served the military. Um, and I've uh, got a son who's a police officer, so we serve the community and the country. And just give us an idea of what it is like now, because every, everyone comes off, they've done the march pass, they gather here, and you can see, it's wonderful to watch people just chatting away, isn't This it? is only part of it. It's the, it's, it's the gathering, um, making, making new and old friendships, you know, rekindling those friendships, but sharing the stories, the, um, the laughter, the jokes, the banter that we all have amongst us. It's a, it's, I would say, within the, much as, his, his Majesty's Forces, there's, there's a second to none, right? So the joy that we have amongst each other, you can't get it anywhere else. It's, uh, it's a special moment. It's very special to see. Mark Jewell, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you, Cheers. The march past on horse guards continues. Princess Royal on the dais taking the salute. She is both an admiral in the Royal Navy, a general in the army, and an air chief marshal in the Royal Air Force. But today, in the uniform of an admiral of the Royal Na Navy, chief commandant for women in the Royal Navy. And with her on the dais, the newly appointed Secretary of State for Defense, Grant Shapps, on her left. And on her right, Vice Admiral Sir Clive Johnson, who's the national president of the Royal British Legion.
Horse guards looking like a cross between a parade ground and a sort of celebration party for people who've been marching past the cenotaph. And as Sophie was saying and talking to people, it's a great reunion that happens here. One of the things that brings everybody here is to meet up with their old mates, come from all over the world. Well, I'm joined here on Horse Guards. Everybody gathering here, as you say, for a sort of reunion and sharing memories. Kanisha Meadow, who was uh, served with the Army, and JJ Adams, who served with the RAF. Thank you both very much for talking to us. Um, JJ, first of all, you, when you left the RAF, you, you felt that you were devastated, weren't you? Absolutely. It was, um, for me, I'm the third generation, all through the three generations. And I was completely and utterly lost, but I went into security, which was a parallel in a way, because most of us are ex-military, so we had that, still had that military structure. But I felt as if that was it, it was all over. It was very, very difficult, very difficult. And so being here today, with all this gathering, with all this sort of you know, reconciliation, people meeting again, what is it like for you? It's just brilliant. A few emotions, a lot of emotions, people I haven't seen for 30 years, people I haven't seen for so long and we all have that nod you know when somebody walks down the road you just look at them and you think they're ex-military you just know <laughs> and it's a great comfort and it's a belonging it really is it's our family and what about you Kanisha it's a great experience to be here it's my first time being here and it's a great opportunity to remember and to reflect remember those that's gone before us and also reflect on our time serving as well and it, it's a much more light-hearted atmosphere here now, but when you walk past the Cenotaph, and given it was your first time, describe that moment, what was it like? It, it was a thrilling moment for me, as I said, it's first time being here, and being able to give him the opportunity to remember on a large scale and being around um, some people I've served with as well, um, it was a very memorable and great experience for me. And you wanted to be here as well, just to show people that veterans are, are all ages, really. Yes. Is, is, there's no sort of distinct veteran, is there? Yes. And one of that came about from my experience in 2020 at Waterloo Station, when I told someone, oh, I've served, I'm a veteran as well, and I wasn't taken seriously. So it was a little bit disappointing, a little bit heartening. So this is a great opportunity to prove that veterans come you know, male, females, every colour, every nation. So, great opportunity to be here, to be a part of. And JJ, who did you remember when you were walking past oh, the Oh, from lots of friends that I've lost, my family as well. And the, the biggest... And you must say your father's medals, your grandfather's yes. medals that you're wearing. Yes, as much as I can, because without them, I wouldn't be here. And it's, it's so important that we have to look back to be able to see forward more clearly. And all we ask for is for the length of time it takes to make a cup of tea, just to remember us. That's all we ask for. Thank you both very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Sophie. Sophie. Thank, Thank you, you, Sophie, very much. A powerful insight into what brings people young and old here on this Remembrance Sunday. And in another part of Horse Guards, Princess Royal still taking the salute. With a long way to go. London Transport going past. And still marching past in style.
Well, a lot of people here who are taking part for the very first time, and for them it is a really a bigger moment, a big moment, an emotional moment, and, and that goes for Mark Reed and Richie Sharp. You served together in Afghanistan, didn't you? In 2009. Yeah. And you didn't see each other for a long time after that. Yeah, yeah. And then you've marched in with Help for Heroes. Just explain why it has been so important for both of you. Um, so we, we, we kind of kept in contact through social media, um, but we never saw each other face to face. Um, early 2019, I left the army myself, started working with the Help for Heroes late 2019, and my manager at the time asked me to get in contact with a veteran who'd reached out to the charity. As I was reading down the information, um, first thing that jumped out was the name, then the cat badge, um, and then it was pretty obvious. So when I spoke to Richie, I identified myself as Mark Freed first. However, I've always been known as Taff. Um, so I had to say Richie is Taff, and we went from there. So tell us what it was like today for you two to, to oh, march past the amazing. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, event. Uh, absolutely humble and privileged to march with Mark. Uh, he's helped me uh, over the years after my finishing my time, uh, injury-wise, and um, like I say, very humbling indeed. It's a lot of, for a lot of people, it is about reconnecting, isn't it? It's about seeing each other and those connections that you don't really have with anybody else, do you? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's been, besides Richard, there's been 40, 40 more veterans that Help for Heroes works with marching today. Um, and as Richie said, it, it's a humbling experience, but to march alongside those beneficiaries of the charity is even more humbling. Um, they get up each and every day, Richie to my left here, and they get on with life, and, it, and it's so amazing to work with uh, them. Do you know what? It's humbling for all of us to see as well. Thank you both gentlemen very much for talking to us today. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Back here on Whitehall, the Cenotaph now rises up from a field of poppies, each wreath bearing witness to the memories of those who came here today to honor family or friends killed in war. The glorious dead are the words inscribed on the Cenotaph, but lest we forget the words that are more often heard on Remembrance Sunday, and there is little chance of forgetting the First World War, then the Second, and the wars almost every year since with fighting raging today in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East. As the saying goes, only the dead have seen the end of war. From Whitehall in London, goodbye. This rem